in our hymnals. Let us now rise to begin the service. my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our intro it from Psalm 119. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Seven times a day I praise you for your just and righteous decrees. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, by your grace, hear the prayers of your church. Grant that those things which we ask in faith we may receive through your bountiful mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Our Old Testament reading, which also serves as the basis for the sermon, comes from the prophet Habakkuk in chapters 1 and 2. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write a vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy in chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And we rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the 17th chapter of St. Luke, beginning at the first verse. Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day 
and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any, of, any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. The hymn of the day is hymn 764, and you may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I would invite you to open your Bibles with me to the prophet Habakkuk in chapters 1 and 2. This begins on page 933 in our Pew Bibles. And to start, I'll read just a portion of Habakkuk's question to God in chapter 1. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? And let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, indeed we live in a world that has, has so much destruction, violence, evil, anger, and death in it. Many times we do not understand these things or why you do not act more quickly. And so we pray, dear Lord, that you would comfort us by your word and spirit, that our eyes would not look at the things which bring us sorrow, but at that which Christ has done to redeem us and the world. Help us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. You know, it's a funny thing about reading the Bible, that at different times in your life you read certain passages, especially from the prophets in the Old Testament, and they sort of bounce off. They don't have a lot of meaning. And then maybe you change, or something happens in your life, or that which you see going on in the world, and suddenly the words of the prophets from 2,500 years ago becomes very much alive. It's like they were writing today. And I see that as the case with the prophet Habakkuk. He has been called the questioning prophet, for he has a lot of questions to bring to God about the situation that he finds the southern kingdom of Judah in. Uh, and he, he vents some of those, those, that bewilderment in the opening verses of chapter 1, but of course he is taking it to the right place. So many people, when they see violence in the world or experience violence themselves, um, they, they decide there is no God and there are no answers. Habakkuk, he knows there is a God, and he knows there are answers. It's just that he doesn't have the answer at this point. And it doesn't seem like God is acting according to his character. For God is holy. He is righteous. He hates sin. He has created us for good. And yet Habakkuk is seeing just the opposite in his world. And he is not talking here about the kinds of things that we might call natural disasters, like we saw in Florida and the East Coast uh, states this past week natural devastations of hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, fires, or the kinds of things that come about because of illnesses, you know, because of sin, capital S in the world, those aren't the things that he has a real concern about. It's the things that are happening because of sins, little s, the sins of people. Why isn't God acting? So chapter 1, verse 1 starts out the oracle or burden that Habakkuk the prophet saw. And so now he is laying down that which he had seen and was interacting with God about. Verse 2, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? That is one of the hardest things for God's people to comprehend, is that in our distress in our situations that are causing us such heartache and grief, we pray and pray and pray, and it's like heaven's doors are closed to us. God's ears are shut. And, and so he says, or cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why aren't you doing something, God, is the underlying question here. Not new to us, is it? one that people have wrestled with ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. And then verse 2, Why do you make me see iniquity? Behold iniquity. Why is it all around me? Why do I have to look at this? And the word iniquity is kind of a full term. It carries the, the, um, the inferences of falsehood, vanity, idolatry, injustice, those are all kind of wrapped up in that word iniquity. Why do I have to look at this? Why does this have to continue in front of me? And why do you idly look at wrong? See, so that's almost a charge that he's bringing against God here, isn't it? You don't care. 
You're just up there playing your video games, God, and you're unmindful of what is happening here. And you know, one of the things that impresses me about the scriptures is their, and I'm going to use almost a cliche word now, their authenticity. The Bible does not cover up the dirt of its heroes. It shows them in all their sinfulness, in all their doubts, in all their struggles, in all their complaints. They are real flesh and blood people just like we are. And so we can be comforted that when these questions come into our minds, it's not like, oh, I can't ask that, I can't say that, I can't think that, I can't feel that, because God will be mad at me. God's got big shoulders. He can handle your doubts, your complaints, your accusations. He can handle it all. But the fact is, Habakkuk is a child of God who is coming to his heavenly father with his concern, with his complaint, with his fear, with his disillusionment. And God does not reject him, but will give him an answer. Maybe not one that Habakkuk is looking for, but he will uh, be sure to answer him. God is not sitting idly by, uh, unmindful of the wrong that is going on in the world. Uh, in verse 3, Habakkuk continues, Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. And let's wrap in verse 4. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. See how I said it's like he's writing in 2022? Look at the fact that whether you're talking whatever political party, there's corruption within them. That they claim and make all these promises that they're going to do this for us and they're going to solve this problem and the problems continue to get worse. We see that the streets, especially of our big cities, are awash in violence and crime and it's like the, the law is powerless to do anything about it, and in fact almost seems complicit in no bail laws and letting criminals go free to terrorize on the streets once more. Homes are breaking apart and fracturing. People are at odds with each other. We can't learn to, we can't simply disagree and discuss. We've got to hate each other and maybe even do violence to each other like sadly we saw uh, that man run down an 18-year-old kid because he thought that the kid was a, an extremist politically. And we cry out to God, why? What are you doing about this? Why aren't you acting? Rise up, O Lord. And so we see the closing part of verse 4, for the wicked surround the righteous. They're everywhere. So justice goes forth perverted, twisted, injustice, not justice. Pretty powerful stuff, huh? Well, God gives him an answer in the next verses, which aren't part of the appointed reading for today's um, uh, pericopes. But God says, I'm going to take action and you will be amazed. The Chaldeans, which were kind of like the forerunners of the Babylonians, they're going to come racing through and my judgments will come down upon the wicked. But it's got to wait. The time is not yet. And so there's this dialogue back and forth through the end of chapter 1 and we move then into chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. See, there is still this expectation that God will answer my prayers, or at least he will give me an answer, whether it's the one I'm looking for or not. And so I'll wait. I'll listen. I'll hope. And that is a tremendously good perspective for all of us as God's Christians. That even as we pour out our complaints, even as we become impatient at the slowness of God, to recognize that God does have his own timetable. Think about how impatient people got throughout the Old Testament times as they are looking at all these promises of a coming Savior, and yet he doesn't come yet, he doesn't come yet, he doesn't come yet. 
And they must have cried out to him in every generation, Oh Lord, come, save us, redeem us, bring the Messiah, bring the Deliverer. And yet it waited. God waited and waited. And as Paul then wrote in Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under law, that's you and I, so that we may receive the adoption as sons. You see, to do it at any time other than the appropriate time brings disaster, not salvation. And so even here, as Habakkuk is crying out for God's judgments to come down and to be rescued from the wicked, God yet still seems to be holding off. And yet he does not sit idly by. He is there to aid his people. He is there to comfort them by his word. He is there to watch over them, even though they may have to go through the fire together with the wicked, they will not be burnt up and destroyed as the wicked will be. We will not be burned up and destroyed as the wicked will be, even though we may have to suffer many afflictions. And I know, in our day and age, everything is so accessible to us, everything is so immediate, we are so impatient, we want everything solved like yesterday. And when God tarries, when he waits, we get mad and accusatory. And yet, stop and think about it. Why do you think God does withhold sending down the fire and the brimstone right away? Why doesn't he just simply immediately go after the evildoer and wipe them out, turn them into a spot of grease in the middle of the floor? Well, Peter writes that God is not slow concerning his promises as some consider slowness, but he is long-suffering, patient toward us, not willing that any should die, but that all would come to repentance. Every day that God withholds his judgment is not because he does not care. It is because he loves his creation dearly. And if he were to punish sin immediately and wickedness immediately, none of us would survive it. None of us would. Because we all sin daily. We all defy God. We all are like sheep go astray. And if he were quick on the draw and were immediately going to destroy every evildoer, we would be destroyed. And yet he was patient toward us. He continues to lavish his forgiveness on us through Jesus Christ. We who are his baptized people now are being placed like Habakkuk in a very violent world and a violent society to do something toward the good. Toward the good. And so as Habakkuk stations himself waiting for the Lord's answer, verse 2, the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it, or that he who runs can read it. In other words, Habakkuk is to have a message so plain, so obvious, that even somebody hurrying past it will be able to read it and at least understand it and hopefully will consider it. What the message is exactly, we don't know. Probably something along the lines of judgment is coming, repent. And also, the just shall live by his faith. We see that coming up in verse 4. But that message is the message Habakkuk is to place out there of law and gospel. That message is the message that the church planted here in our culture now must proclaim boldly. We don't need to now go hunker down and hide from the vitriol and the hatred and the bile of this world. Now is the time to stand up. Now is the time to be firm. Now is the time to look, pray, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word to call sinners to repentance, including ourselves, so that we don't so much imitate the world that the world cannot tell whether we belong to Jesus or the devil. But to stand and to proclaim that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. 
It is this time now that the church, and I mean you and me and all his Christians, finally decide to stand for something. Otherwise, as the old saying goes, we'll continue to fall for everything. We live in a world that's confused and mixed up. God is not unaware of that, but too often we are. We simply go with the flow of being confused over gender issues or or tax policies or this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, political policies, that's one thing. When you get down to the moral issues, though, that's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where the church can really make a difference. We're not here, and we're not called to to put out social statements, political statements. We are called, as his Christians, like Habakkuk, to put that message so plain and so bold, whether it's with our words, whether it's with our lives, whether it's in our churches, to be God's people in the midst of all of this violence. For the vision still awaits, verse 3, it's appointed time. Judgment's coming, but it's not coming yet. Not yet. It hastens to the end, and the word hastens there is kind of interesting in the Hebrew. It's literally gasps. Think of a Think of a marathon runner as he's racing towards that final line and he's gasping for breath and he's pushing himself on to cross that line. That's the the description here about the vision awaiting its appointed appointed time. It's gasping toward the end. It wants to reach it um, and it will not delay. It'll come at the appointed time, not beyond the appointed time. The judgment is coming. But in the meantime, God continues to hold out hope and restoration, and rescue. And so finally, verse 4, Behold, his soul, the soul of the enemy, the Chaldean, is puffed up. It lives by violence. It lives by conquest. It lives by all of these immoral and wicked things. It's not upright within him. And contrast that now to the people of God. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Faith in what? Faith in the true God who holds us in the palm of his hand. Faith in the true God who has sent his son to redeem us from sin, death, and hell. Faith in the God, in the word of God that promises us that even if we go through difficulties, his grace is sufficient for us. For his strength is made perfect even in the midst of our weakness. And that with all the violence around us and the discouragement Discouraging things, we do not lose heart because we have a Redeemer who came, died, conquered death by his resurrection, and is coming again. And we are the people of God. Yeah, we have a dilemma as God's Christians of why he lets these things go on. And yet he assures us that his good and perfect will is being worked out, and his patience is for the salvation of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep each of your hearts and minds in true faith to life eternal. Amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we pray for Jerry Brady, who is hospitalized, for Darlene Schuert on hospice care, for strength and healing for Linda Jackson, Darlene Rothy, Karen Cray, Wallace Warner, and Diane Geiger. We give thanks to God for Jerry and Donna Rochford as they celebrate their 46th wedding anniversary. Our prayers of sympathy for the family of Kay Armstrong, who passed away uh, early this morning. Her funeral will be held later this month. And, of course, for those who are being so terribly affected by Hurricane Ian. At the conclusion of our prayers, we continue then with the confession and absolution. Let us rise for prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, there are indeed many things that cause us distress and bewilderment as to why you allow things to continue in this world. And we do know from Holy Scripture that even before uh, great judgment comes, 
you allow smaller judgments to come along as a way to try to wake your people up and bring them to repentance before it is too late. And so indeed, as people turn away from you to worship the created things of this world rather than you who, who is the creator, then there is a time where you turn people over to themselves and let the wickedness of their own hearts burst forth as a form of chastisement for their sins and for their turning away from you. We pray, dear Lord, that you would keep us from going too far, that yet there may be time to be brought back as a nation, as a people, and as individuals from the brink. Let us now, O Lord, as your church, stand for those things which are holy and wholesome and true, and be willing to take a stand, even if it's a costly one, to proclaim Jesus to those around us. Let us not join in with the wickedness that the world is embracing. Let us not become part of the way that this world thinks and operates. But may we be your light and your salt in this world among those around us. And when we do stumble and fall, dear Lord, we thank and praise you that in Jesus we have forgiveness and life. And by your spirit, you continue to pick us up once more and to lead us in the way that is right. And so, O oh Lord, watch over your church, your Christians, each one of us, that we may live as you're baptized, putting our full trust, hope, and confidence in your word and promises to us in Christ. Be with Jerry as he is hospitalized. Help him, O oh Lord, and grant to him strength so that he will come home soon. Uh, ease his discomfort and pain, and we pray that the treatments he is undergoing will be effective on his behalf. We thank you that Darlene is continuing to do fairly well, even on hospice care. Bless her time yet in this life and with her family, and help her rejoice in her Savior, Jesus, who is with her. Continue to be with Linda, Darlene, Karen, Wallace, and Diane in their infirmities, that you would grant strength and healing according to your will. We thank and praise you that you have blessed Jerry and Donna with 46 years of marriage and with the family that they have. Continue, O oh Lord, to watch over and keep them in the years ahead, that they would remain faithful to their marriage vows and be a reflection in their lives toward each other of your love toward your bride, the church. Comfort the family of Kay Armstrong, whose soul you have called out of this life and home to yourself. We give you thanks for the life that you had given Kay in this world and the eternal life that is hers in Jesus. And may your peace be there for her family at this time. And dear Father, once more we have seen again what living in a fallen world can, can contain. And so we pray for all of those who have been so severely affected by Hurricane Ian, especially in Florida. Be with the families of those who have died, be with the injured, we pray that there are those who may yet be missing who can be found yet alive. We pray also for all who have lost property and possessions during this difficult and tragic time. Yes, O oh Lord, these types of events remind us that this world is passing away. But you, O oh Lord, continue to help us focus on those things which are eternal that cannot be taken away. So, dear Lord, work through your people work through many people to bring help and assistance to those who are suffering at this time in Florida, in Georgia, in South and North Carolina, and in other parts of our country that have suffered from this hurricane. Bring help and, and, and relief, we pray, so that your word may stand firm and people's hearts may be lifted up in hope. All of these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
For as much as it is our desire to receive the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us now confess our sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. <laughs>
Our service continues with the Nunc Dimittis, and we rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 